we just want to uh, mention to all of our attendees this morning uh, the need for continually preventing the COVID-19 spread. Now, over the past uh, 10 days, we've had a total case uh, number of 139,000 uh, increasing, you know, obviously in the past few days. On the 22nd of June, we've had 11,000 new cases. On the 20th of June, we had over 13,000 new cases, uh, bringing up the total cases in South Africa to 1.8 million. So with this third spike, we really want to encourage every single person to please continually try and prevent COVID-19 by washing your hands regularly with soap and water. Uh, keep those alcohol-based hand sanitizers with you at all time. We also think of plumbers who are working with tools, uh, moving tools from one place to the next or swapping over tools using the same tools. Uh, please remember that cross-contamination can happen very, very quickly. So avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with any unwashed hands. Avoid close contact with sick people. Cover your cough or sneeze with a flexed elbow or tissue, and then please throw that tissue away. And always ensure that you are cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched objects and surfaces. Uh, frequently means as often as possible. Uh, this is not weekly. This will be during the day. Uh, every few hours, you will need to ensure that the tools, equipment, uh, the objects that you are touching, door handles, uh, etc., are cleaned and disinfected, especially if they are being touched by others. So we really are uh, wanting to focus our time and energy on health and safety, uh, particularly as an institute, as well as an industry of plumbers out there. We really want to set the standard of those who take this seriously. So thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to the Tech Talk this morning and we'll hand over to Steve Fonzell. Are you there, Steve? Yes, I am. And good morning, Chris. And thanks for that introduction. Um, a big uh, good morning to all our listeners. Thanks for logging into, the, into today's session. Um, to my co-hosts, um, I just want to say thank you for putting this together. Uh, we really want to try and raise some awareness around plumbing in thatched roofs. You know, generally, you know, when one thinks of fire, you perceive it as scary, frightening. It's an occurrence involving hot flames, toxic smoke, um, causes major devastation, destruction to property, injury and death sometimes to people. Um, and as I said, even uh, a loss of, loss of life. And I think today the awareness around it is just we can prevent fires. What are those good practices? Um, and, um, you know, it, it, good preparation sometimes is, is, is key. And I think we'll address that through this presentation. Um, I'm going to be, well, we'll be touching on things like a video, we're going to a video on thatch, uh, thatch on fire. Um, we're going to have a look at what SANS 10 to 106 uh, talks about uh, what can and can't be done if you're allowed to install um, a solar onto a thatched roof. We look at some fire and risk. Um, which fire extinguisher can be used. Um, we're going to just show you some research that we've done in other countries or what they say um, needs to be done in a thatched roof, some good practices. We'll recap on the goods and the, the not so goods. So with that being said, I'd like to just lead into our first uh, video, which is just showing you a thatch on fire. The next uh, slide, basically, we, we've come across, in fact, recently, there's been a lot of instances where there's been fires. Um, some of them, as we're aware, have started from electrical. Others, uh, for example, um, are just basically where there's just been no good, no, no good practice at play. Um, a torch that's fallen over, um, that's maybe caught a light. Um, the pictures are always not, don't always reflect the thatch, but the top one just shows the devastation within a roof that's also got um, normal tiles on, um, you know, so if even if it's got tiles, the danger of fire is always prevalent, is out there. So the plumbing standards and what they say regarding working in thatched roofs. So what we could find is that within SANS 10106, which is the, the installation, maintenance, repair and replacement of domestic solar water heating systems, under the scope, it clearly says, and if you look at 1.3, it does not cover the installation of solar water heaters on thatched roofs. We've uh, basically looked at a lot of the other standards 
And guys, it's been here. I want to just say it's been, there's no clear cut guidance that you may or may not work um, in a roof um, with, with, with open flames. Um, like I said, the only one we really could find was the plumbing standards uh, for uh, 10106. Um, and basically, it clearly says you can't put a thatch on a, on a thatched roof. And it does, however, say that if you are going to install a solar geyser, um, that it can be done on a separate structural platform, just basically away from that thatched uh, structure. If you can imagine uh, solar geysers and collectors, you know, absorb a lot of heat and you don't want that heat falling onto a thatched roof, and then obviously you've got uh, potential for a risk happening there. We've also looked at SANS 10400T, and if anyone's interested, there is a standard for thatched roof construction, and that is SANS 10407. Chris, next slide for us, please. And I think at this point, I'm going to hand over to you to just talk, talk us through some uh, higher risk uh, safety. Thanks again, Steve. So yes, obviously looking at your SAN standard and also applying the principle that we see at the general safety regulations, uh, section 4.2, the use of flammable liquids. Now you'll notice here that it states that an employer shall uh, require or permit flammable liquids to be used or applied in any other room, cabinet or enclosure, especially constructed for this purpose of fire resistant material. So we are not allowed to use uh, flammable liquids. Now, obviously, anything that could create a flame, uh, create a fire, is not allowed to be used in uh, any areas or enclosed areas that are not constructed for this purpose. Or as you see there, uh, owing to its situation or construction or any other feature, is of such nature that no fire or explosion hazard can be created. Now, when the law states that no flammable liquids can be used, uh, the reasonable man legislation will also then be applied in the case of anything that is flammable in an area uh, that cannot withstand flames, such as being in a thatch roof. So things that we do need to look out for on a fire and risk side, uh, even wooden trusses or the insulation material that is being used. When you are soldering, please be careful of the drippings that uh, come off of this. Any plastic items such as conduit, pipes, or wiring, these can either be heated up, uh, you can slip and trip over these inside thatch areas, uh, you could even drill or maybe uh, cut into these causing electrical shocks, also thereby creating a potential fire problem. The correct handling of butane torches. Now we've seen this uh, before. If you do not correctly handle a butane torch, if you do not hold it up correctly, uh, this thing just spits out flames. And in fact, it spits out the actual gas as well. Uh, and this can create quite a nasty flashback. And what this will do is superheat the air around you. Obviously, you know, if you are inside a thatch roof with all that dry grass, uh, there you have the huge potential of having open flames burst into flames with that uh, dry grass, dry grass rather. And then uh, taking a look at what we should have. Uh, in fact, we looked at the environmental regulations for workplaces. Now, the environmental regulations tells us that we should have uh, firefighting equipment wherever we are doing hot works. And if you want more information on that, you can go look at regulation two of the environmental regulations for workplaces. This affects every single company that has any hot works uh, regarded as something that could create a flame. Now, having regard to the size, construction and location of the workplace, right there we can stop and say, have you done your preparation? Do you know the site that you are working in? what is going into your risk assessment. Then the amount and types of flammable articles used, handled, or stored on the premises. Now it comes to the legal liability of the employer. They shall provide on the premises an adequate supply of suitable firefighting equipment at strategic locations. Strategic locations means as close to where the fire may erupt. So we do not want to be inside a thatch roof and have our fire extinguishers inside our buckies. We cannot get out of that roof to our bucky and back into the roof in enough time uh, to be able to fight that fire. So some suggestions that uh, even uh, some of the plumbers came up with uh, that we've spoken to out in the industry is things like having a wet cloth available, 
perhaps even something that uh, like a spray bottle with water inside of it so that you can constantly wet down hot objects maybe after soldering uh, depending on if this is not going to affect the structural integrity of your soldering make sure that you have these readily available and very importantly uh, you want to have a supply of fresh air into the environment uh, so either by mechanical means or just natural means opening up airways but we also want to be careful of this because fire thrives on air on oxygen and so the more oxygen you give it the more fire comes out so have that air available for yourself but as soon as a fire comes out please ensure that you close that ventilation try and isolate as much as possible the flames from getting out of hand so the law is very very specific when it speaks about fire resistance it means the minimum period for which a building element or component will comply with your SANS uh, 0177 standard. And the uh, provision of this regulation is obviously meaning that any time you have the possibility for hot works, you want to ensure that you have adequately prepared for it. Now, just as a side note, uh, something very important for us to know, what type of extinguisher should you be using? Well, for one, we also need to understand how fire works. Now, fire can spread in three different ways. It can be conducted through items. It can be convected uh, through the uh, environment around us. And then it can also radiate its heat and have other things that is in its vicinity at a close enough proximity to also catch a light, as you see in the picture on the right hand side so conduction uh, through a wall if the wall is heated up enough uh, the objects on the other side of the wall could then ignite and that is because the wall itself uh, obviously only turns into flames at very very high heats obviously uh, thousands of degrees celsius whereas the cardboard boxes thatch roofing etc that is on the other side of that wall does not have a very high ignition point and so uh, the conduction of heat through that barrier could still be sufficient uh, for it to be able to burst into flames. Now, this is important, obviously, when working in a thatch roof or even working near a thatch roof. And things like connecting solar panels onto thatch roofing, uh, connecting geysers in and around thatch roofing, or even any type of uh, plumbing works that require hot works to be done that is near next to or even in a separate room where there is thatch on the other side now again this is calling to our mind the need for preparation and understanding the entire workplace around us is there a possibility for something that we do not see to be able to catch a light convection is another way that heat will obviously rise up now 80 percent of the heat in a flame will actually radiate into the air around it the atmosphere around it and because hot air rises it will carry that heat it then turns into like a huge circle moving back down obviously as the cool uh, cooler air starts dropping it then moves toward the flame again and this creates what we call a convection very much like a mushroom in a bomb uh, that you see it moving up out down and then back towards it again this convection increases the heat constantly around it it also bellows out smoke and the smoke then makes it very difficult for us to see and if we cannot see we obviously cannot fight fires if we cannot see we also cannot evacuate correctly so it's always very important for us to know and understand how fire spreads uh, again the last one on radiation that's a very simple one if you're brying uh, you want to check if your coals are hot enough you put your hand just a few centimeters above that bra grid and you can feel if it's ready for the voice if it's ready for the chicken or whatever else you are brying for that day you will know just by feeling it not touching the coals but just by the radiated heat if it is hot enough and yes you can burn the meat even without touching the coals if it's hot enough and that's what we call radiation so be careful of the way fire spreads and obviously be prepared in case it could happen again it calls for preparation so what extinguisher should you be using or taking with you uh, to sites that have the possibility uh, of hot works and the possibility of a fire well there are five different fire classes it's a b c d and k very simple to remember a leaves ash so that would be paper cardboards etc b boils so it's a flammable liquid 
Uh, C is for current, so it's any electrical type of fire. D is for dense materials, such as R beams, purlins, things like that. And then a class K is for uh, flammable things that you find inside a kitchen, uh, generally speaking, of the actual cooking oils that you are using. So a class B and a class C is both flammable liquids. However, a cooking oil is so much more dangerous because if you use the incorrect fire extinguisher on a cooking oil, uh, it can be quite disastrous. So let's take a look at the two fundamental uh, fire extinguishers that you will be using. A DCP or blue label fire extinguisher, as you see on the left hand side of you, it's got a white and blue label. So very simple, if you see it's a blue label, this is a potassium bicarbonate fire extinguisher or what we commonly known as a DCP, a dry chemical powder blue label fire extinguisher. Now it's very simple if you don't know what types of fires it extinguishes. If you look at almost the top second part of the fire extinguisher, the red blocks, uh, you'll see little fires uh, surrounded by a red block. That actually tells you what flame it will extinguish. And just on top of that little red box, it's got A, B, and C. So this is an A, B, C fire extinguisher. It can be used on flammable liquids for a class B. It can be used on a class A, so paper, cardboard, wood, things like that. And then it also works on electrical current fires. The downfall is when you use this indoors, the powder can obscure your vision. <clears throat> it's not dangerous. So if you inhale it, please don't worry. It is not dangerous uh, to inhale it or to taste it. But it will also damage other machinery that is in the vicinity. So yes, it's going to put out the fire of the electrical machine. It's not going to conduct electricity, but it has the possibility of obviously um, damaging that piece of equipment. And so what should we be using with electrical equipment? Class C uh, is definitely a CO2 fire extinguisher. This is clearly identifiable by the black label. It contains carbon dioxide. It does not have a little uh, monitor on top of it to tell you what the temperature is or the gauge of the pressure is on this um, extinguisher. It literally only has CO2 inside of it because it uh, self ignites, basically uses its own uh, pressurization to expel this type of CO2. And it is a B and C fire extinguisher. So it can be used on boiling liquids, as well as a class C electrical current fire. So those are the two fire extinguishers we should be looking at. Uh, this is the anatomy of a fire extinguisher, a carbon dioxide fire extinguisher, obviously on the left hand side over there, you're looking at the safety pin, then the pressure uh, <clears throat> relief device that is controlled on the inside of the actual fire extinguisher. And then you have your discharge tube with your gas CO2 inside and your liquid CO2 inside as well. And as you obviously depress this, the CO2 will come out and little bits of ice will come out with it. On the right hand side, you'll see a water one or even a DCP one that is very similar. Uh, these two fire extinguishers obviously work in exactly the same manner. They just dispel it out of the hose and obviously either water will come out or DCP will come out. Now they've done away obviously with a lot of water ones moving over to hose reels instead. Uh, but one of the things that we want to mention to you is that the law specifically requires all fire extinguishers to be internally inspected. Internally inspected means by you, the company, every single month. Now, yes, there is the law stating that a SAQCC repairman has to come out every year and check whether your fire extinguishers are in good condition. But the law requires you as a company, the owner of that fire extinguisher, to inspect it every single month. Now, you might say to yourself, well, I'm not qualified to inspect it. Well, the inspections are very, very simple. You look at the entire outside, as you see on the left hand side, are there any damages? Uh, is there any uh, powder coming out of this? You do a tap test. In other words, you hold the hose and you tap it at the bottom and you see if any dry chemical powder comes out. And uh, let's take a look at the overall condition of the fire extinguisher as well. Check the pin. Is the pin there? Is the anti tag tamper uh, pin also there? Is anything missing from the fire extinguisher? And then move over to the actual pressure gauge. And please, we want to ensure that the pressure gauge is full. The cylinder must show in the green. If it is not in the green, if it's empty, well, you cannot use it. If it is over pressure, you also cannot use it. 
So please remember, uh, it is a legal requirement that a monthly inspection must be done on each piece of firefighting equipment. So just to wrap up from our side, uh, from a fire and risk perspective, one of the things is being prepared, knowing the site that you're working in, knowing the types of tools and equipment you're going to be doing and the scope of works that you're performing. And some common fire hazards are overloading of sockets. Uh, Obviously, there's no power points uh, inside uh, certain areas within your working space on ceilings and perhaps inside thatch roofing. And so you've got to pull up cables. Please do not overload these. Do not have any open flames where there is a possibility for fire. This includes smoking. Please don't take a shortcut. These shortcuts do end up in uh, very serious injuries or perhaps even fatalities. And then the site around you. What can you say about your site? Obviously, the electrical equipment, the geyser installation that you're, that has its own risks and hazards attached to it as well. And so the need for preparation and a good risk assessment is extremely vital. So thanks very much. We hope you adhere to this information. If you need more information on firefighting, we did offer you the free handout on our OHSS basic firefighting course. You can go through that, use it as a toolbox talk, or perhaps use it as internal training for each one of your staff. Know what a fire is and also how to fight it. So we're going to hand it over back to you. Thanks, uh, Steve or Harry. Thank you very much. That was super informative. Um, Harry, would you like to talk to the next slide or um, can I just maybe just go ahead and do that? Steve, I think you carry on. You did this research, so maybe okay. it's better for you to deal with it. Okay, great, great stuff. So thank you very, very much. So what we've also managed to try and find out is what do other people do across the, the globe? And uh, we managed to find some uh, um, a leaflet um, basically in the UK. And um, we want to just share this with, with you guys. Um, and it's clearly there with a little red arrow is it says roof voids. And it makes reference that no hot work. Uh, plumbers in roof voids need to use push or compression fittings um, as good practice. Um, they also make mention frozen pipes. So obviously, it gets cold in some areas. Should only be thawed by hot uh, cloths and um, not with a blowtorch, hot air stripper or hairdryer. Um, uh, do not allow smoking uh, or the use of a candle or a lighter or match um, as emergency lights or to check what you're doing in the roof void. Remember that the interior of an unlined thatch roof is dry, dusty, and flammable. Lofts should be kept free of storage items and allow ease of access in case of fire. Access hatches should not be less than, obviously, they make some reference to the size of that hatch, obviously, taking into account that, you know, if something does happen, that the plumber or the person in that roof void needs to get out as quickly as possible without being restricted. So, guys, it's not, uh, it happens all all across the world. As I said, um, there's uh, specifically speaking that it's a very good practice to use rather push on and compression fittings. Harry, would you take the next slide for us just uh, by summing everything up for us? Sure, thanks, Steve. Um, so let's have a look and, and let's see good practices here. Uh, compassion fittings, obviously, number one. Fire extinguisher, as um, Chris has alluded, is that uh, I think it's very, very, very important that with uh, working with open flames and torches, I think it's an essential piece of equipment that you need to have with you. Um, contact details of your fire brigade. Um, in that area that you're operating. And then firefighting for your staff, obviously very important. And I know that there are opportunities, Chris, for some of the guys to do uh, firefighting training with yourselves and or associates with your, uh, uh, that you are connected with. Um, one of the, I think the important thing is, is to try and reduce the risk. And how do we do this? Um, I think one of the one of the big important things here is people need to understand how to handle this butane torch that they are working with. You know, if you open the gas and then you're looking for a light or a match to 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 actually light up the the flame, that in itself already creates a problem. So have your 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 open flame or your light or whatever ready and then open the gas um, so that you don't or reduce the risk of of uh, basically a small gas explosion that can create other problems. 
then um, obviously preparation. Have a plan, have whatever you need ready. Um, and, and one of the suggestions was maybe a little spray bottle of water. Uh, we all know that uh, in a lot of instances nowadays, you get this uh, paper material that they uh, use as insulation. So, and those things, in my opinion, I don't know whether it's the right thing to do, but in any case, it's there. So you've got to be prepared. You have to look at your environment before you enter the roof, before you go in there with your flames and your whatever equipment to make sure that you are ready for anything that might happen. Then um, using the torch, uh, I think uh, if we look at the not good uh, side, smoking obviously in the roof space is nonsensical. You are creating a problem for yourself. Open flames. When you're talking about the torch is, um, and we understand that sometimes you get into a situation where it's difficult to get to the flame or get the flame to the the spot where you want to solder and inevitably that happens that people start turning this torch around so the moment you turn the torch upside down then there's huge issues because then you don't only have a flame you have a gush of flame and gas being emitted which in itself creates huge issues so i think in the training environment with your staff at all times just keep them reminded of this. Don't turn the torch around. Keep it upright. Make sure that your flame is of such a nature that you're not going to um, burn anything else around it. Faulty equipment, obviously. Once again, coming back to torches, um, lighters, uh, matches, all of these type of things. Make sure that you have the correct equipment to do the job, number one. Number two, to have it done safely. Then um, the sections in green there, um, you know, we all understand that everybody is in a hurry. You're trying to uh, fit the pipes where they should lay. And in a lot of instances, people tend to forget about other things such as electrical connections, wiring in conduits, wiring lying around. You know, the guys are just applying the torch, trying to solder the, the pipe, forgetting about the wiring and the stuff that's in close proximity where you can actually cause that wire to fuse and cause electrical shorts. So always be mindful of what is happening around you, what other objects, plastic objects, even uh, plasticized pipes. Uh, we've, I think most of us have seen this, where people are trying to do the job, doing soldering, but forgetting, or, well, I don't know, I won't say ignore, but maybe forgetting and not, realizing that there are other items in close proximity that might ignite. So just be careful of all of these things. I think that's my uh, part for this, Steve. I don't know if there's anything else that you or Steve uh, Brown want to elaborate on. Uh, just to end off with some good fire safety practice on uh, inspecting the work area, area daily and then uh, be an observer. Housekeeping is extremely important. That's why it's down three times. Uh, always try and think before you act. Uh, use your best safety device, which is your brain. So take a look around you and see if there is something that potentially is dangerous. Uh, if you're not sure, why not ask? Uh, you've got the resources available. Uh, the three of us that uh, are, we're here today, Steve Fonzel, Gerry Gort, and myself from OHSS, if you need any information, please do not hesitate to contact us. And then report any situation that you may think is dangerous. Perhaps we can come up with a solution for you. So maybe do a bit of a practical today. One of the things we wanted to find out, uh, check if your company has a fire plan. If not, uh, this would be something very good to have in place. If you plan for something, you'll be prepared for it. So thanks very much. We'll give it uh, over back to you, Steve, to wrap up. Um, from our side, I just want to say to, to my co-hosts, thank you very, very much for a very informative uh, webinar. To everyone out there, download the, the handouts um, from my side. Thank you very much for making time. Please keep safe. Um, we hope you enjoyed the webinar. 